Episode number 29. Mr. Lorry and Monsieur Defarge had made all ready for the journey, and had brought with them, besides travelling cloaks, and wrappers, bread and meat, wine, and hot coffee. Monsieur Defarge put this provender, and the lamp he carried, on the shoemaker's bench, there was nothing else in the garret but a pallet bed, and he and Mr. Lorry roused the captive, and assisted him to his feet. No human intelligence could have read the mysteries of his mind, in the scared blank wonder of his face. Whether he knew what had happened, whether he recollected what they had said to him, whether he knew that he was free, were questions which no sagacity could have solved. They tried speaking to him, but he was so confused and so very slow to answer that they took fright at his bewilderment and agreed for the time to tamper with him no more. He had a wild, lost manner of occasionally clasping his head in his hands, that had not been seen in him before, yet, he had some pleasure in the mere sound of his daughter's voice, and invariably turned to it when she spoke. In the submissive way of one long accustomed to obey under coercion, he ate and drank what they gave him to eat and drink, and put on the cloak and other wrappings, that they gave him to wear. He readily responded to his daughter's drawing her arm through his, and took, and kept, her hand in both his own. They began to descend, Monsieur Defarge going first with the lamp, Mr. Lorry closing the little procession. They had not traversed many steps of the long main staircase when he stopped, and stared at the roof, and round at the walls. You remember the place, my father? You remember coming up here? What did you say? But, before she could repeat the question, he murmured an answer as if she had repeated it. Remember? No, I don't remember. It was so very long ago that he had no recollection, whatever of his having been brought from his prison to that house, was apparent to them. They heard him mutter, 105, North Tower, and when he looked about him, it evidently was for the strong fortress walls, which had long encompassed him. On their reaching the courtyard he instinctively altered his tread, as being in expectation of a drawbridge, and when there was no drawbridge, and he saw the carriage waiting in the open street, he dropped his daughter's hand, and clasped his head again. No crowd was about the door, no people were discernible at any of the many windows, not even a chance passerby was in the street. An unnatural silence, and desertion reigned there. Only one soul was to be seen, and that was Madame Defarge, who leaned against the doorpost, knitting, and saw nothing. The prisoner had got into a coach, and his daughter had followed him, when Mr. Lorry's feet were arrested on the step by his asking, miserably, for his shoemaking tools, and the unfinished shoes. Madame Defarge immediately called to her husband that she would get them, and went, knitting, out of the lamplight, through the courtyard. She quickly brought them down, and handed them in, and immediately afterwards leaned against the doorpost, knitting, and saw nothing.